on a lonely planet slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinauts. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race one stranded explorer at a time. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of The Blunderbirds in which we are going to be rescuing this fellow here who it was quite funny actually he put a, he put a post on the subreddit saying welcome to Elu in celebration of landing his craft here and then he shortly realized that he couldn't actually use the second stage to get off the ground because as you can see the craft doesn't actually fit through this gap so it it was a rather it was rather tragic and I took pity and I thought it was quite a funny sequence of events I thought why not go and rescue him so here we are launching Blunderbird 8, is it now? Yeah, it's Blunderbird 8, because this is the ninth episode, but we have used Blunderbird 2 for two missions, so this is the 8th. I mean, like, at first I had this idea of making this series like the actual Thunderbirds, in that we only have, like, sort of five vehicles, and then we just use those to go out the solar s go throughout the solar system. But I thought, it's kind of it's kind of a bit boring to just keep using the same craft over and over again. I mean, Blunderbird 2 could easily be used to do pretty much every episode of the Blunderbirds, except the Eve and Tyler episodes. Maybe the Val one, it might be a struggle as well, but either way, I thought it'd be kind of cooler to do a, a new rocket. And given that Blunderbirds is kind of meant to be here to help people, I feel like doing an SSTO to Elu is probably not the, the best uh, the best form factor to be showing a rescue mission in the hopes that people will be able to emulate it, which is why I've decided I'll probably end up redoing, well not redoing, but I'll do another Mun and Juno Blunderbirds in which we don't use an SSTO and try and use something a bit more replicatable. But to make this video a little bit more interesting, uh, the more eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that this main booster we have there, oh there go the fairings by the way, that main booster there is equipped with aero brakes, or air brakes, and landing gear because it's going to be Landed. We're gonna we're gonna land it. Uh, the the launch vehicle it was kind of inspired by the Falcon Heavy, in that we have three identical boosters all strapped together, with the two side ones feeding into the main tank, which was the original plan for the Falcon Heavy. Although it isn't actually going to do that anymore. Um, but either way, we 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 decided to stick to the the old plan. It was a little bit in stock game. It wasn't really possible to do it like a true Falcon Heavy, in that both the side boosters land. So what I kind of did was I took the main booster and made that able to land and then the side boosters are identical to the main booster except they don't have landing gear so like the fantasy in my head is that this space program these boosters are only rated for one landing and then one use afterwards so we land the booster recover it refuel it and then we just take all the landing gear off and it just gets relegated to being a side booster that then gets crashed into the ocean that's the story I, I'm going with but there we are little landing so I, I undershot the KSC a bit but you know, the, the point of this video wasn't really the booster, it's just kind of a nice supplement to it. Because see, I got a very small amount of clearance to the ground, but it was okay. Probably could have done with a few more landing legs to take the weight, but there we go. Let's not waste any more time talking about the craft itself. So I kind of put a lot of emphasis into making this thing look cool. It's very inefficient for what it is, or what it needs to be. Well, first of all, it has a huge amount of fuel. It has way too much fuel, really, for what this mission demands. But I'll get on to why I've over-engineered it later on. But I kind of want it to be kind of Apollo style in that we don't drop any, we don't have any asparagus staging or anything like that. This is all just one great big monolithic structure now. It's going to take us to and from Elu and, and yeah, take us to and from Elu. So Elu is one of, those, the, one of the last remaining places I've not been to yet in Blunderbirds. And it's one of the places I've wanted to go to for a while. And I was thinking about how to do this mission. Obviously, there was the option of doing an SSTO, which I've done EDO SSTOs before, and they're very difficult to do. I don't really think it's the best, you know, format for Blunderbirds. Oh, this is me making them a new node here. So then I thought, well, I could do a rocket and do a dual gravity assist, which is what I always do for ELU return missions. I've done a couple of ELU missions where I've just put space stations or surface bases there that I haven't, I've done a little bit less efficiently. But in generally, generally, I always use a dual gravity assist because you save a bunch of fuel. But then I thought, let's try and make this mission really super easy to replicate. So we're going to just get to Elu without doing any gravity assists whatsoever, which demands an enormous amount of delta V, um, which is why we have this great big craft. So we're kind of doing two burns of periapsis to maximize our use of the Oberth effect to save as much fuel as possible. So we're going to do one burn to get ourselves into an eccentric Kerbin orbit. I made the maneuver node kind of two orbits ahead for some reason by accident, so I had to quickly skip through one orbit. And then we'll do our second burn. I was aiming for a sun periapsis of about 73 million, 
uh, as the value. Uh, it's, it's meters, right? Or kilometers? I think it's, kilometers seems to fit more in my head. Oh, there we go. We've got it now. 74 billion meters. So yeah, 74 million kilometers. So that's kind of the apparatus I went for. There is a lot of wiggle room in my bear in mind. Now, we could burn at our ascending node to get our inclination collect corrected for ELU because as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, ELU is at a tilted orbit, but it's much, much cheaper, like to the region of like one kilometer per second of delta V cheaper to do it at the descending node, which does increase the mission duration. But again, if you want to save time, you'd probably do a gravity assist. And this is more kind of how to get to ELU kind of the easy way. I mean, some of you may be wondering, you know, this doesn't look very easy, Matt. <laughs> um, well, Ilu is, is a very is a late game destination, really. Um, so I'm, you probably, uh, if you're going to be doing an Ilu mission, you probably should have got Juno and places. You can go to Juno quite easily. So this is kind of, it's meant to be a more challenging destination. Anyway, I was talking about this earlier and I got sidetracked again. So yeah, like I said, the um, the ways I've thought about doing this mission, oh, there's our encounter, by the way. So actually, no, I will talk about this briefly. So the way I did this was I got my initial orbit around the sun to be 73 million kilometers and then I adjusted the inclination so that we would our orbit would be intersecting Elu's orbit. This bear in mind I, I didn't wait for any kind of transfer window or anything I just did this as and when and then once I got the inclination right I just made another maneuver node and you can just drag on your prograde marker very slowly and you'll just see the uh, encounter node swing around and you'll get an encounter. So um, it's the same thing for Moho. I don't tend to bother waiting for transfer windows for Elu and Moho because to get into an orbit around a planet, you must match orbits with it. And since Elu and Moho have very small gravitational and rotational energy, it doesn't really matter if you match their orbits inside or outside of their sphere of influence. So we can begin to raise our periapsis to Elu height to get our encounter and then finish off the capture burn once we're within its gravity well. And that's how I get to Moho as well. It's the same thing. So that's does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Uh, we can move on now. Speaking of being inefficient, <coughs> I realised I was in an equi in a polar orbit around Elu, which is not what we want ideally. I mean, we could do it from a polar orbit if we wanted to, but it's far easier to do it from an equatorial orbit. Although that being said, I did end up being in a backwards equatorial orbit, which is... I guess it doesn't really make too much of a difference, but either way, it's, uh, I prefer being, you know, OCD about it. So we had to waste a bit of fuel there just to get ourselves into a more ideal orbit, but ultimately we had enough, we had enough, so it didn't matter. So we can switch Jeb into our kind of Apollo style lander and get ourselves an encounter with the craft. So this ship is kind of like the natural evolution of Blunderbird 1, the one that went to Val. It's very similar in terms of its actual, you know, Apollo style lander design, very long range nuclear t stage, but it's got a few improvements. For one, I think the lander aesthetically looks better. Uh, even though I think this la this lander is inferior to the one that went to Val. Not so much functionally, but just like the Val lander was cooler because it was Apollo style and it had kind of a better pod layout, but I, I don't, whatever. Maybe this this is probably technically better actually, forget what I said. But um, the actual ship itself, the mothership, it's um, much more aesthetically pleasing as I say, and it's got a larger crew capacity as well because I always felt it was a bit unrealistic just jamming all the Kerbals into one kind of Apollo style command module and that was it. So it's got kind of a four seat hitchhiker storage bay as well which in my imagination is where like the uh the stasis bays are the cryogenic pods so the covers obviously don't have to be conscious for the whole mission so that's kind of i don't know it's just a cooler craft just a bit more of a just a cooler craft i guess but there we are planting our obligatory blunderbirds flag and then we can switch over to the stranded kerbal and this was like the final uh idea i had for this mission so a it was either ssto this which is like an apollo style landing or doing like a mining ship pretty much like the one that got stranded just to be like yo let me show you it's done but i don't know it just feels like a bit of a cop out to do a mining ship because it's very easy oh did a little bit brought some science equipment because this is this person is using a sandbox save mode not a sandbox a career save mode so i thought oh we'll take some science get him some science points but actually um we didn't actually end up getting that much science because i guess they've already transmitted data back from the surcelia before or maybe we've got science rewards down i don't really I don't really know. Either way, we're getting a bit sidetracked here, and that's not really the focus of this mission. So we can just do a few crew reports and then time accelerate towards a point where we can get ourselves an encounter with our target ship again. So when we're ready, we the ladder, we the gear, and off we go. So pretty much heading 270 degrees, because obviously we're going into a backwards ELU orbit, so we're wasting a bit of fuel, but to be honest, it's not a huge amount on ELU. <laughs> uh, and then we're just pretty much pointing flat straight away there's no atmosphere to contend with on elu so once you're clear of the ground and you don't end up sort of 
accelerating slower than it takes you to reach your apoapsis, you can pretty much fly flat straight away. That's the uh, ascent choice for pretty much any body that doesn't have uh, an atmosphere. There are exceptions, like obviously if you're in something like the Drez Canyon or the Mohole, you need to burn up first, you end up smashing into the side of a cliff. Some places on the Mun are like this as well, but generally, especially places like Tylo and Ilu, and which are generally quite flat, you know, you can burn flat straight away. Now, at this point, we didn't have enough Delta V in the lander to do our rendezvous using just the lander, so we had to do a bit of burning using the mothership. Although Bill Kerman is not a pilot and in this save mode, um, that means that he can't use SAS or, you know, auto guidance or anything like that. So we kind of had to do everything by hand manually, just like the good old days in KSP before they updated it and made it just a better game. But, eh. It's not too bad. We did most of the rendezvous using the lambda, so it wasn't a huge amount of burning we needed to do. And at this point, we've burnt off so much fuel that our thrust weight ratio is much better than it was at the beginning of this mission, so... Eh, it's fine. So other than that, we can use our last remaining 30 meters per second of delta V, or, you know, three units under, to get ourselves iron counters. We can do a bit of burning with a monopellet to really save on fuel. If our ship, our mothership as well, did end up spinning out of control a little bit, because it's got no S an SAS enabled, so... Just enabling sort of time warp freezes ships in place just to counteract that. But there we go. Beautifully done. So you'll probably have to use monopellant if you're not as experienced at docking as I am. But I like just showing how to dock without monopellant. It's it's not really that hard. It's just a case of patience. So we can just board our Kerbal into the uh, into the stasis bay, I guess, where all the pods are in my imagination. Move our lander away. And there we go. But like I say, it's very easy to dock without a monopellant. So I tend to do it in most of my videos now. You just get yourself nice and far away, align the docking ports from a distance, uh, point the docking ports to kind of be within alignment using SAS, and then just coast one towards the other, just under a meter per second, and it should easily do it. So at this point, it's going to be quite a big burn to get back to Kerbin. We're going to be using pretty much all of our remaining fuel to get our Kerbin encounter. But obviously, unlike with SSTO missions, we don't need to worry about having fuel left when we encounter Kerbin for kind of retro raid burns and manoeuvring ourselves to the KSC. Um, we can, and obviously, have to plan another gravity assist to make sure our Kerbin encounter is nice and slow. We have a heat shield, so we can be hitting Kerbin's atmosphere at hugely high speeds because of how powerful the ablative shields are in this game. So we didn't have to, I wasn't worried about doing a particularly efficient Kerbin encounter or having to think about gravity assists, things like that. So. And just under 300 meters per second of delta V remaining, which is more than enough for what we need What we need to do. I mean, I know I said at the beginning I wanted to over-engineer this craft to make it as easy as possible, and so you're wondering, well, this is actually quite a fine, finely budgeted mission, but don't forget I did that hugely inefficient maneuver earlier to get our ELU uh, orbit uh, equatorial as opposed to polar. Um, I could have said a bunch of fuel if I'd kind of made a maneuver node in advance to get ourselves on a more optimal trajectory. But whatever, I'm guessing that if you're doing this mission, you'll probably make similar mistakes throughout the mission. So it's kind of like my way of sort of engineering in pilot error, I guess, to show that this mission is doesn't have to be done to the letter for it to work. And there we go. We have ourselves a nice curving counter. I went with a periapsis of 34 kilometers, um, which we know we're going to be, look at that, we're only on the edge of Kerbin's sphere influence. And we're already going nearly 4,000 meters per second. So we're going... We'll be going in well over five kilometers a second when we hit the atmosphere, but we have a heat shield, so this thing should be able to tolerate it. At least the command pod will. I can't say the same thing for the uh, transfer stage as you were about to witness. <laughs> I do love a good firework display. There we go, yeah, you can see. Normally I reduce the amount of ablator on my heat shields to save weight, but I thought we're probably going to be using a lot of it. You can see it just starting to drop down quite uh, quite quickly because we're still going an enormous... Uh, see, now this is the kind of speed where I would be entering Kerbin's atmosphere for the first time if this was a SSTO mission because obviously in those missions we don't have the the, uh, the luxury of heat shields, but eh, we're fine. So we're actually starting to ascend from the atmosphere again. We did capture at Kerbin, but our initial speed was so high we still have the momentum to leave the atmosphere uh, briefly. So we can just time accelerate and get ourselves. Look at that! Some things. It looks like some debris actually survived the uh, the Armageddon that was the, you know, the nuclear stage re-entry. There we go. We're definitely going to be. Yeah, our apoapsis is well below the Kármán line now, so we can deploy the chutes. Lovely little camera angle from camera tools. 
And there we go, there go the, the shoots, and we can deploy the ablative shield because we don't need it anymore. And you know, sometimes the ablative shields, they explode on touchdown for some reason, so we may as well just ditch it now. And then we can slow the footage down, and uh, better witness to touchdown, there we are. And all in all, a rather successful mission, I believe, if I do say so myself. So other than that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this installment of the Blunderbirds. Elu was a place I really wanted to include in this series, so I'm glad we've done that out of the way. And now on screen, uh, top left is the music video version of this video, which um, I highly recommend if you want to see more. Uh, top right is the full Blunderbirds playlist. Bottom left was my most recent upload, and bottom right was specially chosen for you by YouTube's algorithm. And remember to join my Discord, follow me on Twitter, and if you want to, my Patreon is also in the description. And have a good rest of the day.